We are in the immediate vicinity of a mass kill of humanity through a thermonuclear war. And just take an estimate of the number and capability of the thermonuclear weapons on the U.S. submarine fleet in the Pacific. Because that's exactly where the attack on Russia and China is going to come from. It's going to come across the Pacific. It's going to come against China and Russia and some other countries around there. That's the target. And it's going to be a preemptive target with the idea that with the first launching of these bombs, nobody's going to be left alive in that vicinity. That's the reality of politics now. We have been living under a financial empire based in London. The ideological commitment of that empire has been for centuries the depopulation of the human race. And up until recently, the time span for achieving such an evil was not as urgent as it is now for that empire. That is, until the financial collapse erupted in the transatlantic economies, creating a crisis in the empire itself, threatening its very existence, vastly shortening the timetable for a mass kill of the human race. The build-up and potential detonation of a thermonuclear world war is now moving more rapid than anything that could be voted on in November. In fact, the Democratic Party's recent refusal to challenge an Obama second term is now a major factor in accelerating this war drive from within the United States, and that means we're looking at a timetable of mere months and weeks. So this war must be stopped now. This acceleration began last year with the killing of Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, a sign that the war was on and the British financial empire was running out of time and needed a conflict that would provide the most genocide as humanly possible, and that is to engage Russia, China, and the United States in a global thermonuclear war with the Middle East being the launch pad. Since that time, and even as recent as the last three months, it has been shown that an increasing push for such a thermonuclear war conflict is at hand. As of this week, the U.S. Navy has approximately 14 Ohio-class submarines in service, eight assigned to the Pacific Fleet and based in Bangor, Washington, and six assigned to the Atlantic Fleet based in Kings Bay, Georgia. Now, look at the power of the missiles that are being carried by these submarines. Just as a comparison, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima only had a yield of 13 kilotons. The W-76 nuclear warheads aboard these submarines are 100 kiloton warheads. There are six to eight of these 100 kiloton nuclear warheads on each Trident missile on these submarines. And the Ohio-class submarines are each armed with 24 Trident missiles. That means each of these submarines alone has the firepower of approximately 1,476 Hiroshima's. And we have eight of these submarines stationed in the Pacific region right now. The four Royal Naval Vanguard class ballistic missile submarines, home based in Scotland, are also armed with Trident missiles, though they carry British warheads rather than U.S. supplied warheads. It has been reported that the U.S. Navy maintains four ballistic missile submarines on patrol at all times, two in the Atlantic and two in the Pacific. The remainder of the U.S. Navy's submarine fleet consists of 54 attack submarines and four converted Ohio-class guided missile submarines. Their mission includes special forces and intelligence gathering operations, divided roughly evenly between the Atlantic and Pacific fleets. So, with this picture, we're not talking about a small conflict between nations. We're talking about the annihilation of the better part of the human race. Now, even with such an insane prospect clearly underway, the build-up to that insanity continues. Recently, two ships of the United States Navy, the nuclear submarine USS Annapolis and the destroyer USS Momsen, have passed through the Suez Canal into the Red Sea to reinforce the U.S. naval forces already present in the region. 
Although their destination is confidential, they are now getting dangerously close to the Persian Gulf. Currently, the United States has two aircraft carrier groups in the region, headed by USS Abraham Lincoln and USS Carl Vinson. It is expected that another aircraft carrier, USS Enterprise, will join the strike force in March. Since the EU placed a new round of sanctions on Iran by putting an embargo on Iranian oil, Iran is once again threatening to use military force to close the Straits of Hormuz, and already moving two warships into the Red Sea. Meanwhile, a Kuwaiti maritime official said on Monday that the Gulf Cooperation Council group of Arab countries have contingency plans for Coast Guards and naval forces should there be an attempt by Iran to shut down the Straits of Hormuz. But that's not all. According to France's military intelligence service, Obama had decided to send 9,000 troops to Israel at the end of January or early February for a U.S.-Israeli exercise called Austere Challenge 12. Of course, British forces will participate. Anti-missile defense system Arrow will also be tested. According to the uh, French intelligence service, U.S. forces are scheduled to remain in Israel till the end of 2012 and beyond. To be added are the huge U.S. weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, such as the 80 F-15 warplanes, which amount to $30 billion, the 96 anti-missile missiles to the Emirates, and the 210 Patriot missiles to Kuwait. But apparently, the U.S. buildup in the Gulf is making the British quite happy. On January the 24th, U.K. Defense Secretary Philip Hammond declared that the passage of the U.S. aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln into the Persian Gulf on January the 22nd, escorted by British and French warships, had sent a clear signal about the resolve of the international community to defend the right of free passage through international waters. And he added that the U.K. is prepared to send further assets into the region as well. Not only is the destroyer HMS Daring, which departed Portsmouth in the first week of January, more than halfway to the Gulf, but another British warship, the HMS Westminster, departed Portsmouth on January the 21st for a seven-month deployment east of Suez. Hammond added that we also maintain mine countermeasures vessels in the Gulf, which are an important part of the overall Allied presence there, and of course, the UK has a contingent capability to reinforce that presence should at any time it be considered necessary to do so. The Ministry of Defense told the Associated Press that the Royal Navy also maintains four anti-mine vessels, two other uh, frigates, three support ships, a survey vessel, and one hunter-killer nuclear submarine in the region. All of this is in addition to two U.S. Navy carrier battle groups and an amphibious ready group that are also on station in the region, not to mention air and ground forces, including 15,000 Army troops in Kuwait, also deployed in the region. Furthermore, on February the 4th, the White House announced that British Prime Minister David Cameron will be welcomed to the White House for an official visit and a state dinner on March the 13th to 14th. The visit will highlight the fundamental importance of the U.S.-U.K. special relationship and the depth of the friendship between the American people and the people of the United Kingdom, as well as the strong personal bond that has developed between the two leaders and their families. This was said by White House spokesman Jay Carney, who added that the Obama and Cameron meeting will have in discussion the upcoming NATO and G8 summits as well as the broad array of global issues on which the United States and the United Kingdom cooperate closely in order to advance our common values and shared interests, including Afghanistan, the Middle East, Iran, human rights, and global economic stability and growth. What was not announced is whether the Cameron-Obama meeting will be accompanied by a meeting of the U.S.-U.K. Joint Strategy Board, which was created during Obama's last visit to the UK in May, and which is supposed to meet on a quarterly basis on military and other affairs. 
It should be no secret at this point that the special relationship between the UK and the US is led by the British financial empire employing American muscle to do its bidding. And President Obama is its willing subject. The British, you could say, made the car that the United States is driving in. This brief picture of the buildup for World War Now should be considered a wake-up call to both the American citizenry and the American government, especially with the recent act of cowardice shown by the two major parties in the United States, that what we face is not some replay of the Iraq War, or not even some minor confrontation with Iran or Syria. This is a desperate last-ditch effort on behalf of the British Empire to eliminate the majority of the world's population through global thermonuclear war. And we don't have much time to stop it. But to stop it means removing Barack Obama from office immediately before he pushes that big red button and launches thermonuclear war.